Welcome to the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. My name is Derek Leon Washington, UN Human Rights and Cultural Anthropologist. My name is Alanya Chin with UN Visitor Services. Before we begin today's events, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement from where we are on the island of Manhattan in New York City, part of the homeland of the Lenape Hoking Territory. We pay our respects to the Lenape people, past, present, and future, and their continual presence in the homeland and throughout their diaspora. So this year's theme, a new social contract, leaving no one behind. And I believe you started with a land acknowledgement, and that's the beginning of new social contracts, acknowledging the land where we're at, but how can we move forward as well, move forward collectively, but also center the expressive culture, the ideas, and the decision-making of indigenous peoples. So one way that we're going to do that is showing a short film. So this short film will include or center Joe Baker, Delaware Tribe of Indians, enrolled member, Denape Diaspora, executive director of the Lenape Center, and he's talking about history, a sense of home, and understanding our shared histories. Hello everyone, I'm Joe Baker, co-founder and executive director of Lenape Center. We're based here in Manhattan. I'm standing on the banks of the Hudson River, and behind me is Inwood Hills Park. If you are interested in experiencing Lenape hockey, in its most original form, that's the place to go. There are still 200-year-old tulip trees, the caves, and most importantly for today's discussion, that mythical place of the supposed purchase of Manhattan. They even have a plaque there, purchase of Manhattan. Well, of course, we don't support that theory, that story, and we um, invite you also not to embrace that notion of, of the fairy tale of the purchase of our ancestral homelands. Lenape Center was created in 2009 uh, as a response to what we felt was the loss of, of uh, public awareness of our history, our place, or our, our homeland here uh, on the island of Manhattan. There was a certain urgency to that because no longer, if you were in the city of New York, did you hear people speak of the Lenape. In 12 years, that's changed. And I credit Lenape Center for that change because today it's very much a part of the conversation. One individual of great importance tribal elder Nora Thompson-Dean. She, in the 1970s, began a series of return trips to the ancestral land of our people. And she would return to Oklahoma and share stories of how, what she felt when she was here in the presence of, of this great landscape, this physical presence of our spiritual home. That inspired in me the curiosity 
to know more about our homeland, this place that we come from. Since 2009, Lenape Center has been creating partnerships and collaborations with museums, universities, schools, uh, and other nonprofits uh, to create art installations, create public art events, uh, share the history of our people, the Lenape, and, and we're working toward now uh, exhibitions. Knowing that in the beginning that we would not arrive and be successful by making a loud noise, we would be successful if we were focused and if we were quiet and if we were committed to building lasting relationships with the partners here within the Cultural Center of Manhattan. We knew that it would be hard work, that it would require time and commitment and focus, and it would be based on the principles of our culture, which are generosity and beauty. We want our Lenape people to have access to the art and culture of this great city. We want to bring them home. That was the purpose of the creation of Lenape Center, and it's still our main mission today. I want to thank Joe Baker, just with the importance of the film of revisiting history, showing different types of history, and really understanding our shared histories. And going back to the, our theme of a new social contract, of really moving towards a plan of action. Now moving halfway across the globe to the islands of Hawaii, we have another short film called Standing Above the Clouds. I do first want to give a shout out to Jelena Leanne Lee and also Pua Case for the conversations and sharing this work of art with us. In excerpts of Standing Above the Clouds, we will get to behold the power of women-led movements and how they draw upon their ancestral wisdom and strength to protect their homelands in the present and leaving an impact in the future. If you'd like to see the entire film, you can check out the link below. Oh, na ala a papa, kula lani, ala iluna, ela oi. He kupen o gava a o poli a hu. Just standing with your family members, your daughters, your mothers. There's always an element of fear. You know them at home. You know what makes them cry, what makes them angry. You know how fragile they are, as well as how strong they are. And then you're on the front line with that. When I see my girls upholding their own, standing in the line, um, working with others and, and calming them down and following in my footsteps, I'm extremely proud of them, and I think would I leave them somewhere else and face this by myself, um, I could never do that. No matter what, win or lose, the Mauna won. There was a nation that was awakened. I mean, just from, for myself, I wouldn't be doing the things that I do today had it not been for the Mauna. The guardians of that mountain are women. When the women come together, and call upon these women, guides, to hear us. You know, when I look at the women in my life, I am in awe by just how incredible they are. When we're standing together, there is the 40, the 400, the 40,000, the 400,000 women behind and around us. Women of all colors, of all ages, on this mountain that we love so deeply.
What I really enjoyed about standing above the clouds was the idea of reclaiming space, reclaiming space with music, with movement, with bodies. And that relates to our next piece, our next cultural expression, our next piece of art. We have a huge Mola tapestry. Now, when I first saw this Mola tapestry, when I first came into the General Assembly building, I turned my head to the right and I saw all of this color, all of this animals taking space. And I believe that that relates to the film is the idea of taking space and reclaiming space. Can you tell me a little bit more about this Mola? The Mola tapestry is a gift from the indigenous Kuna people. The tapestry itself is made by indigenous Kuna women. And it's large, as you say, and it typically it's used for blouses and for attire. But here we get to see all of the different images and symbolism up on the wall outside of the General Assembly. So we have just that through line of intergenerational. We have that through line of women. And we have even a bigger through line of women, gender equality and gender equity all encompassed in this monumental mole taking space. Right, so the designs and the textile images are passed down from mother to daughter. And it can take days, weeks, even months to make a mola because it requires a lot of planning and also creativity. And so I can tell you a little bit about the process if you're interested. Oh, yes. Well, it's called reverse applique. So what you'll actually do is take different layers of cloth. Mola means covering or any type of uh, fabric that covers you. And so as you layer the different fabrics and you can cut them back, you'll see these really dynamic images and color that give the tapestry life and power. So I like how you said life, power, and process. So I'm also thinking the process is different peoples starting on different parts of the mola and just the stories, the conversations, the jokes. And that even relates to our, our broader themes of a new social contract and leaving no one behind because there's a lot of listening in that process as well. There's a lot of listening to people of different ages and of different gender identities. So this piece of work, this cultural expression relates to conversation. I'm sure, does it also relate to economics? Yes, so the MOLA has a lot of meaning when it comes to not only community empowerment, but also economic empowerment, because the indigenous Kuna women are responsible for making the MOLA so they can generate income and support for their communities. And they actually have intellectual property rights over the MOLAs. Perfect, so it also with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's really shown economic inequality and also just other forms of inequality as well. With this Mola tapestry, how it relates to the economic well-being of some Kuna communities, speaks to this idea of a new social contract that needs to require health. It needs to require economics. And it needs to require all gender identities at the table. Definitely. This tapestry is really a representation of the resilience and the resourcefulness and the skills and creativity of the Kuna women specifically and indigenous women in general. So I think that relates to our, our, our whole theme, our, our celebration of cultural expression of art, talking about other issues. So we've traveled from New York City, where we're at today, to the Hawaiian Islands, to um, Panama and Colombia and the Kuna diaspora. And again, with the new social contract, with an idea of leaving no one behind, is centering the cultural expressions and listening in an intergenerational way. Is there any other pieces of cultural expression or art that we have in the UN building. Yes, we have more indigenous art right here in the General Assembly building. Would yeah. you like to see? If it's taking space, yes I do. Here we are in front of another dynamic work of art by indigenous peoples. This is an Inukshuk. The Inukshuk is part of the Inuit circumpolar people's creative expression. And so in the model made by the artist Kelly Palik Pishukti, we can see igneous rock placed one on top of the other. And it's this great contrast between the mola, the tapestry, 
and an anukshuk, which is made of rock, and each rock has its place, and it's so sturdy, so it looks like it's about to tip over, but it's definitely not. No, so when it's used, it's as a guidepost as well as a welcome. So for travelers and hunters along their journey, they can see the Inukshuk on the horizon and it will direct them towards a safe village to go to, or they can also tell if a lot of people have walked past if there are stones at the base. And I've seen things similar as I've hiked on the Appalachian Trail and different hikes of people leaving rocks at summits and at different places. And it's really interesting how this Anukshuk has such a, a deep history and symbolism. And I really enjoyed how you said horizon. So going back to our theme of a new social contract and leaving no one behind. So this is the point we're at a new horizon. The COVID-19 pandemic really illuminated social inequalities at many different levels. But the Sanukshuk, again, how it's so grounded, made of stone, which lasts, gives us a new opportunity to find a new way home, a new route. Yeah, it's really important that we center indigenous voices. In fact, the intercircumpolar peoples, which includes the Inuit, have been a part of the conversation at the UN for a long time. So they have a seat at the permanent forum of indigenous issues. They also help to develop and to create the process for creating the Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And the Inukshuk here is a reminder that we need to find a path to peace. That includes everyone. And the Inukshuk, it's an action item, so it's stone, it's, it's centered, but also Inukshuks historically, they're pointing to a certain direction to the, the way home, the way to a community as well. So again, with that symbolism, the Inukshuk can point us towards the path of peace and a path of peace is centering indigenous voices, having a seat at the table. And with our whole celebration today of looking at cultural expression and art is a new way to understand these really lofty ideas, but through the voices of indigenous peoples and the diverse voices within communities. You're right, indigenous art is a really crucial way of understanding the cultures, the histories, and the expressions of indigenous peoples. And we actually have another work of Indigenous art, if you'd like to see. I would like to see it. I'm loving how this Indigenous art is taking space at the General Assembly building. Let's continue our adventure. All right, to the Southern Hemisphere. Let's do it. Now we've traveled to the Southern Hemisphere, where we can see 43 Tuku Tuku panels. I'm really enjoying our, our travels, looking at art and cultural expression, and also our journeys around United Nations headquarters. I'm thinking that these Tuku Tuku panels, they're in the General Assembly and this space for specific reasons. So the Tuku Tuku panels are actually woven by the Maori indigenous people of New Zealand, also known as Aotearoa. And so the idea of the panels is that they adorn meeting houses for the Maori communities. So the United Nations is a global meeting house. and. I believe that's a great symbolism to talk about the United Nations, but also how these are, are made too by people weaving together and working together. So it requires partnership, definitely. Partnership. You need yes. two people working simultaneously to create the weavings. And so it was actually created by a team of 60 from the Maori Weavers Association and overseen by the artist Christine Wirihana. So it really is collaboration, give and take, and creating this work of art for everyone to see. Like we've been talking about relating to this year's theme of social contract and leaving no one behind the idea of this collaborative work mm -hmm. and the United Nations, how it can build back, back better and work better with collaborative processes and also with indigenous peoples at decision-making processes. So this art is taking space it's holding space and it's giving space so we could talk about these important issues. I agree. And I think we should check out the rest of the 43 panels. Let's do it. There are more than 450 million indigenous peoples around the world, across more than 90 countries. Today, we had the opportunity to hear from indigenous peoples and to explore cultural expressions of indigenous artwork here at the United Nations headquarters. So our journey began with a land acknowledgement 
And in conclusion, our journey ends with the land acknowledgement. We're in New York City, we're on Manhattan Island, their traditional homeland of the Lenape people. And also ending is ending with cultural expression, the art of indigenous people. Yes, right behind us, you can see a model of an indigenous canoe called the Kusi Kasai. And this was a gift from Colombia made by the Chilean artist Mario Opaso. And this canoe's meaning is to signify a journey for a life of peace and good fortune. So good fortune, peace, but really focusing on that journey. That journey we're looking for a new social contract, leaving no one behind. So everyone's in that canoe, but centering the ideas, the cultures, the values, and really the decision-making processes of indigenous people. Now, we just touched the iceberg during our journey, but we'll provide more resources to keep this conversation going. So with that, what we would like to say, Thank, Thank you. you. The journey continues. <laughs>